Welcome to the Historical Motion Picture Organization, a podcast in which I interpret ancient historical events as if they were the basis for dramatized HBO style productions. Our first fictional HBO production, The Poison King, will explore the life and times of King Mithridates VI of Pontus in his struggles against the Roman Republic and his attempts to preserve the existence of the waning Hellenistic world. In the previous episode, we explored how Mithridates would triumph over early adversity and take the crown of Pontus in a daring coup. Our HBO series broadcast its premiere episode and immersed our viewers in the world of the show. Mithridates has taken the crown. Let's see what happens next. Mithridates has big plans for his kingdom as we move into episode 2 of our HBO series. In terms of a classical Hollywood three-act structure, we're now coming towards the area usually deemed as second thoughts. It's frankly quite convenient too because the early reign of Mithridates comprises roughly two decades wherein he greatly expands the kingdom, but historians don't know a lot of detail about this period. This early consolidation phase of his reign would slow our TV show to a crawl. How many episodes would we otherwise have to spend on Mithridates' internal organisation and external expansion of the kingdom during this time? Far too many. It's got to get condensed. It's just too long and too unknown of a period before the real story kicks into gear. But we do need to understand just a little of how Mithridates' early ambitions and expansionist policies began to set him on a collision course with the Roman Republic. We know Mithridates expands into Armenia Minor and Colchis to the east towards the Caucasus Mountains. Mithridates also adds the centres and important cities of the Crimea, in the form of the Bosphoran Kingdom, into his realm. They readily surrender their independence in return for his promises to protect them against the Scythians. Remember, a lot of these kingdoms and city-states are the result of Greek colonisation from the centuries previous. The Scythians, however, are just a different ballgame altogether. They're a nomadic steppe people with a terrifying reputation. They live across the vast open plains of modern-day southern Russia. Think of the Scythians as something of a mixture between Gauls and Mongols, adept at riding and fighting on horseback, and throw in some red, yellow hair and piercing blue eyes. They were truly a frightening enemy, and were considered brute barbarians by the more cultured societies of the Near East. The Romans have plenty of their own troubles to deal with, however. Although they're aware of Mithridates' existence at this point, he's far from the top of their agenda. He's expanding to the north and the east. There's not yet any direct conflict of interest with Rome. They're currently stretched quite thin fighting multiple brutal conflicts. The first of these conflicts is the Cimbrian War. It saw the Romans barely hold off a Germanic invasion. After a string of heavy defeats, the Romans slaughtered nearly 200,000 Teutons and Ambrones at the absolute bloodbath Battle of Aqua Sextae. This conflict and the constant threat of Germanic hordes pouring down the Italian peninsula must have done little to ease Roman paranoia and help soothe their attack to defend mindset. The other major war that the Romans fight during Mithridates' early reign is the Jugurtine War, and pitted the Romans against the Kingdom of Numidia in North Africa. It was named after King Jugurtine, who bribed Rome to buy his crown after defeating his brothers in a civil war. Jugurtine, however, then killed Roman citizens during the power struggle, leading the Republic to declare war on him. After waging an effective guerrilla war in the deserts of North Africa, Jugurta ended up in a Roman dungeon, starved to death after the indignity of a triumph. These two wars had startling effects on the Roman Republic. Firstly, the conflicts began a long and deadly rivalry between Lucius Cornelius Sulla and Gaius Marius, two Romans whose destinies become intertwined and whose actions against one another will shake the Republic to its core. The disastrous setbacks experienced by the Roman army led to the Marian reforms. These were a reaction to the military and logistical stagnation of the Republic at this point. Centuries of military campaigning throughout the Mediterranean 
and constant invasions and uprisings across Roman territory had stretched their human and physical resources to the brink. Marius proposed radical alterations, with the intention of creating a more professional, permanent and dynamic Roman army. The reforms revolutionised the Roman military machine, and had a significant impact on the military supremacy Rome enjoyed, as well as unintentionally contributing to the social and political disruption of the late Republic. So the Romans have been busy, haven't they? Well, so's our hero. He's been expanding, training, stockpiling, ruling. The opening sequence of episode 2, with the use of intricately designed infographics and montages, will have to cover decades in minutes. Mithridates develops Pontus, launches building projects, expands the economy, constructs a navy. He's been expanding to the north and the east. Now, with his Black Sea realm secure, Mithridates' eyes turn south and west, towards the fragmented city-states and polities that dot Anatolia. And with the opening montage of episode 2 over, Mithridates' next scheme is to conquer Paphlagonia, with King Nicomedes of Bithynia. Let's just take a moment here and refresh our memories about these territories that surround Pontus. The Kingdom of Paphlagonia is a weak and fragmented area. It's not particularly well organised, and Mithridates considers it ripe for the taking. It used to be under the control of the Diadochoi after the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire, but right now it's not particularly well led. West of Paphlagonia, however, is the Kingdom of Bithynia. It's a Hellenistic kingdom, like Pontus is, but it's a little bit different. The Bithynians were descended from Thracian people, who managed to maintain some kind of independence while the Diadochoi were ripping each other apart. The current ruler of Bithynia is Nicomedes III, and he's described as a crafty, scheming ruler. I can see a great scene in my head for this next event. Mithridates visits Nicomedes III to plot the takeover of Paphlagonia. This is the chance to let our set design and our costume departments really shine here. I just see Mithridates swan in with his entourage, all high and mighty and full of arrogance and hubris. The older, craftier Nicomedes III greets them, and you know, he listens more than he talks, as Mithridates describes how they should take over this organised state and divide it between them. Mithridates could verge on stepping on his toes, but there's two aspects to this which are quite important. This venture is going to create a border between Pontus and Bithynia, and it's also the first Pontic expansion to either the west or the south. This is also where Nicomedes III starts to earn the adjectives used to describe his character. Sneaky, crafty, sly. This guy harbours a little resentment towards Pontus, and these gripes result from unhappiness over historical Roman decisions to grant territories to Pontus instead of Bithynia. The Romans become aware of the Pontic-Bithynian takeover of Paphlagonia. They send ambassadors to demand that the territories are restored to how they were. Mithridates is kind of annoyed. He's been banking on the fact that the Romans might be too busy with their troubles in Germania and North Africa to take notice. But they have noticed. And he's further offended them by arguing that Paphlagonia actually belonged to his father, and questions why the Roman Senate would question this arrangement now when they've never doubted it before. The Romans send ambassadors to try and sort this situation out. And I kind of smile to myself as I imagine the two of them storming out of the talks, highly offended by Mithridates' tone. Next, the ambassadors visit Nicomedes III, who gives a much more remorseful account of his actions, and promises to restore Paphlagonia to its rightful owner. Then, Nicomedes renames his son Pylomenes, copying the traditional name of Paphlagonian kings, and then just installs him as the ruler of Paphlagonia. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. The hubris of this guy to pull off such blatant bullshit. As if giving his son another name and plopping him on the throne is the same as restoring the traditional rulers. I mean, the Romans initially approve this idea because they don't know any better. But once the ambassadors figure out the ruse, their patience is totally worn thin and they storm off back home. So Nicomedes has outmaneuvered both Rome and Mithridates. He's in control of Paphlagonia now. 
And it's probably safe for Mithridates to assume at this point that Nicomedes isn't going to be his best friend in the upcoming struggles against Rome. And again, now Pontus and Bithynia share a border. Mithridates decides to occupy Galatia next. Like, it's just a land grab at this point. He's trying to gobble up as much territory as he can before the shooting starts. And remember, the Kingdom of Galatia is that state that was kind of a mixture of Celtic, Gallic, Hellenistic culture. Next on Mithridates' hit list, Cappadocia, spurred on by a familial issue. So who's currently reigning there? Ariarathes VI is the ruler of the Kingdom of Cappadocia. In his earlier years, he was a weak king, easily controlled by his wife, Laodicea the Elder, who, of course, is a sister of Mithridates. But now there's a little bit of an issue, because where once Ariarathes was malleable and weak, he's becoming a little bolder and more independently minded. Laodicea the Elder is concerned he may break away from the Pontic fold. I visualise a scene here where Laodicea the Elder drops in to see Mithridates. You know, a cup of tea and a biscuit, you know, adult siblings catching up kind of thing. That husband of mine just isn't listening anymore, she says. He's talking about doing this, talking about going there, allying with these people, maybe attacking those people. Mithridates isn't best pleased. Everybody in the family business has to stay on course. He sends his hitman Gordius over to Cappadocia to take care of things. Gordius is Mithridates' Persian hitman. In our show, he was part of the Great Exile Expedition and also participated in the successful coup d'etat that put Mithridates on the throne. And he's kind of his Kappa regime for Cappadocia. He uses his personal popularity there to extend Pontic influence over the region. Gordius is something of a badass. He's equally talented in governance and in violence. So Gordius is the one to do the deed. And he whacks Ariarathes the sixth. I was thinking how would I show this? Knife? Poison? And then I thought maybe I'd have Gordius sneak in. Like an OSS officer in World War II infiltrating a Nazi castle. He strangles Ariarathes, quick and quiet. News about the assassination gets out very quickly though. Nicomedes III, devious as ever, invades Cappadocia taking advantage of the chaos caused by the power vacuum, and once again biting his brief and former ally Mithridates. Mithridates does the dirty work of invading, but Nicomedes sweeps in and takes the prize, as well as imprisoning Mithridates' sister, Laodicea the Elder. And remember, I keep referring to her as Laodicea the Elder, because there's Queen Laodicea, the recently deceased mother of Mithridates, and there's also Laodicea the Younger, Mithridates' younger sister and recent wife. So it's time for a proper showdown, isn't it? The opposing Pontic and Bithynian armies stare at each other across the fields of Cappadocia. Mithridates is facing off against his first external enemy, Nicomedes III. Mithridates is going to have a lot of enemies over his lifetime, and while Nicomedes III might be sneaky and crafty, our hero is going to face far more formidable foes as the saga advances. There seems to be no historical name attributed to this confrontation. I'm going to refer to it as the Battle of Cappadocia. It's not the most inventive, or maybe not even the most accurate name, but I've got a title it's something, and frankly I can't find anything attributed to it by historians. Maybe a listener can correct me on that at some point, if anybody knows anything different. Mithridates' army beats the Bithynians in combat, and I'd imagine that the relentless training and probably superior organisation of the Pontic military, would have influenced such an outcome. But the glory is to be short-lived. The way Adrian Mayer describes the following event is quite funny, I think. Mithridates, having routed the Bithynians, makes a surprising discovery. Here's how Mayer phrases it. Quote, But when he arrived, that's Mithridates after the battle, he discovered that the resourceful widow Laodicea 
had agreed to marry Nicomedes, his sister in bed with that odious backstabber. It occurred to Mithridates that she had probably invited Nicomedes to invade Cappadocia. This unexpected alliance meant that she and Nicomedes would manage Cappadocia together through her pliable son to be crowned as Ariarathes VII. End quote. It just makes me chuckle a little bit. It's like a soap opera. Mithridates bursts in the door and finds his duplicitous sister in bed with his mortal enemy. I can nearly hear the dun 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 dun, dun, dun music from EastEnders. You know, Mithridates standing in the doorway, hand on his sword, mouth agape as he stares down at the nude lovers. All joking aside, there is no source that states Mithridates literally found them in bed together. It's tempting from a kind of comedic perspective to have this scene in the show, but it's totally out of place with the tone we've established. And frankly, Mithridates probably would have butchered both of them there and then in the bed, and that would enormously affect our historical accuracy going forward. So their plan is foiled and Mithridates routes his enemies, instead placing his nephew, the son of the murdered Cappadocian king, on the throne to rule Cappadocia as a puppet state of Pontus. Mithridates wants to control it quietly, without attracting attention from Rome. But again, as always, there's trouble. Somebody should create a Hellenistic era soap opera. The latest trouble is that the young boy king, now Ariarathes VII, refuses to accept a handler, that is, someone who's actually meant to rule the kingdom in secret while he masquerades as a figurehead. And to be honest, I absolutely agree with the lad. Because who does Mithridates suggest should be his handler? Why, none other than Gordius, the man who murdered the last king, the boy's father. And remember that this boy, newly crowned as Ariarathes VII, is the son of Laodice the Elder. So he's Mithridates' nephew. But whose side is he on? He's certainly not going to take orders from Gordius, the guy who killed his father. And again... We have another crisis. And look, as I've said with ancient history, we only have bullet points and then we try to figure out what's happened in between those bullet points. What was Mithridates trying to do here? Surely he must have known the violent reaction that the boy king would have had to such a suggestion. Maybe that was his plan. He wanted to force Ariarathes VII into a corner with only two choices. Choice one, accept his place as a puppet to be ruled by his father's murderer, or choice two, refuse and give good old Uncle Mithridates the pretext for war. The boy chooses the latter, and the choice gives us yet another wonderful set-piece scene to enjoy. Nicomedes III is never one to miss an opportunity, and allegedly sends the boy some military support. This forces Mithridates to assemble an army of his own to confront his stubborn nephew on the battlefield but our protagonist has no intention of bloodying his lovely, shiny new army for such a small fry issue. Mithridates asks for a parley, and after a Cappadocian guard misses a concealed knife in his crotch, Mithridates opens the boy's throat as both armies watch on in stunned horror. I just love this story. I can just see our two opposing sides lining up on the open plains of Cappadocia. It could take hours for this to, to, to be done. You know, they got to line up in the right formation. Everyone's got to be in the right place. There's a lot of standing around, a lot of moving around here, there and everywhere. You get a lot of time to look at the opposing side. Once everybody's lined up, I'd love to have some cuts face to face. You know, it's, it's very quiet. We cut from Bithynians to Pontic soldiers. We really see these guys' faces close up. And other than a kind of a strong breeze, there's no noise. It's eerie. Mithridates and Ariarathes are walking alongside, eyes locking, their arms out of focus in the background. Then there's a sudden mass moan from the spectators, as a motion from Mithridates causes a burst of red mist to spray from the young boy who crumples to the ground. Just imagine those visuals, isn't it fantastic? I, I get tired of hearing today that there are, you know, there's no new stories to tell. That's why movies are all remakes or rehashes of the same thing. Nonsense. Somebody needs to make this. I mean, that's why I'm fantasizing about this as a HBO series. I mean, imagine the shock factor from an action like this by Mithridates. We're seeing even more shade on this guy now. He's our main character, 
He's our protagonist, but he's a ruthless killer. He may be the vehicle that drives us through this narrative, but he's a cold-blooded murderer. I mean, nearly all of these guys are. That was the world they inhabited. But Mithridates has just killed his nephew in front of thousands of people to assert his control over Cappadocia. As both armies remain in stunned silence, Mithridates bounds over to his men and pulls a boy from the crowd, claiming him to be the new ruler of Cappadocia, as King Ariarathes IX. Then, in response, the Bithynians proclaim the second son of King Ariarathes VI to be King Ariarathes VIII. Look, I can hear you shaking your head in silent frustration. Another new king, another new king with the same name. It's ludicrous. But this is what really happened. Let's pause for a second here and make sure we've got a handle on all these kings with the same name. So Ariarathes VI was the original king. He was married to Laodicea the Elder, Mithridates' sister. He was the guy that Mithridates had killed by Gordius because he was becoming too independent-minded. His son became Ariarathes VII. He's the kid who Mithridates has just opened the throat of in front of thousands of people. Ariarathes VIII, he's a pawn set up as the new king by Nicomedes III of Bithynia. He's the second son of Ariarathes VI and Laodicea the Elder. So then who the hell is this startled boy that Mithridates has just pulled out of the crowd? Well, it's his bastard son, who he proclaims to be Ariarathes IX. Ariarathes IX is allegedly the result of an affair that Laodicea the Younger, Mithridates' sister wife, had while he was out of Pontus. Mithridates has had her murdered already, between episodes 1 and 2, which will come out later during this dynastic dispute. So we have two young puppet rulers with the name Ariarathes. The one named Ariarathes VIII is the puppet that the Bithynians, Nicomedes and Laodicea the Elder control. The other, the ninth, is Mithridates' puppet. I mean, don't worry, it gets clearer as we go on. But it's just getting ridiculous. Brothers and sisters getting married, uncles slitting their nephews' throats, fathers installing their bastard sons as puppet rulers. It's absurd. History has ruined fiction for me. Look, the most important thing to take stock of here is that this has made a lot of noise. The Romans get wind of all this anarchy and drama in Anatolia and it gravely concerns them. They're dealing with problems in Gaul and North Africa already and they're becoming seriously concerned about Mithridates' intentions and his aspirations. Don't worry too much about keeping track of all these Cappadocian kids with the same name who are being propped up by one side or the other. They're just pawns. They're just being used. The most important thing is that Mithridates is putting himself on Rome's radar with this carry-on. In Empire of the Black Sea, Dwayne W. Roller tries to get a sense of the Roman reaction to our protagonist's recent activities. Quote, The Romans must have looked askance at the activities of Mithridates. Although it is difficult to credit the statement that his involvement with the northern Black Sea territories was part of a greater campaign that would take him all the way to the Adriatic, the king would have nonetheless given the Romans much cause for worry. End quote. In the midst of a deadly political crisis in Rome, a certain Gaius Marius arrives in Anatolia for a sit-down with Mithridates. The sources say he was in the region for other business, perhaps of a religious nature, but Marius isn't going to miss an opportunity for a face-to-face with the man who's causing so many furrowed brows back in Rome. Marius, who lived from 157 to 86 BC, was a great Roman populist leader, general and a statesman. He meets Mithridates during the Cappadocian disputes, and eventually vies for command of the future Mithridatic War. Marius is a lifelong soldier. He's reformed Roman armies and led them to victory, So Gaius Marius, this, you know, formidable, ramrod, straight Roman soldier with quite a reputation, decides to pop in and see Mithridates and have a chat about all this nonsense in Cappadocia. This scene needs some heavyweight acting and subtle, nuanced dialogue to bring it to life. The conversation between these two titans, one a Hellenistic king from the Old East, the other a soldier, war hero from the new Roman West, 
must have been something incredible to behold. Amidst the degree of mutual respect, Marius nonetheless ends the conversation by telling Mithridates, either make yourself stronger than the Romans, or obey them. Imagine, with the two men locked in solid eye contact. Is it a threat? Is it the moment when the inevitable clash between Mithridates and Rome, east and west, is set in stone? Will it be the final reckoning for hegemony over the ancient Mediterranean between Greece and Rome? Or is it more of a friendly warning, a kind of make your move or pack it up and go home? Again, ambiguity reigns supreme here. Let's let the viewer interpret those words as they understand them. I mean, I like both. I'd convey to my actors in this scene that, it, you know, it's a little bit of both columns. It's a piece of advice, kind of, but it's also a this is the last warning you're going to get kind of moment. We're moving towards the end of our first act. And these petty squabbles in Anatolia are going to look minuscule compared to the wars that have come next. This moment in my HBO show is the line in the sand. Mithridates decides right then in that moment with Marius that he will have to escalate things into a full-on war with Rome. Cut to credits. It's the end of the Poison King episode 2. Mithridates isn't just dealing with minor Anatolian Hellenistic kingdoms anymore. He's now poised to collide with the Roman wolf itself. So this brings us to the conclusion of episode 3 of this podcast series on the life of Mithridates. Join me next time as Mithridates and Rome continue on their collision course and our hero takes drastic action as the story reaches the climax of Act 1. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And bye for now. To subscribe to this podcast, just search for the Historical Motion Picture Organization on whatever platform you use, and hopefully you'll find me there. If you want to follow the podcast on social media, you can find me on Twitter by searching at HMPO Podcast, or on Instagram with the handle HMPO underscore podcast. You can find the show on YouTube by searching HMPO Podcast, and you can contact me directly by email at hmpo.podcast at gmail.com Growing a podcast from humble beginnings is a very difficult thing to do, so if you can support the HMPO in any way, it would mean a lot to me. You can do this by following me on social media, you can share the podcast with even one other person, and you can subscribe to me and give me a good rating on whatever platform you listen on. I will really appreciate it. So thank you for listening, Thank you for your support, and I hope you'll join me again soon in the ancient past.